in order to understand how something works and also in order to develop new technologies, you need to be able to, to write and edit. It's like reverse engineering electronic circuit or some software. So I have no idea what this code does. Let's, let's change it. In the case of the biology, you'll, you'll, you'll take a piece out and now it no longer handles glucose. So you say, okay, that's part of the glucose monitoring system. And, and you can just get through that and you can get to more and more nuanced changes for discovery's sake, but it's often entangled with not just discovering, but making useful uh, synthetic biology. Um, that there, you'll have a challenge that you'll have out there and that will drive the reading and writing technology forward. It will drive our creativity in terms of how these things can positively influence uh, society and ecosystems. Hey everyone, today I'm extraordinarily excited to bring to you Dr. George Church. It's really a special opportunity to talk to Dr. Church because he's one of those rare living historical figures whose work is so vastly influential that it can change our perspective on the potential of an entire field. In my opinion, this gives his generally optimistic take on technology and the future a very special weighting. Through his work in the Human Genome Project in particular, he has directly contributed to exponential shifts in understanding, feasibility, and capability in the field of biology. The Human Genome Project began as a $3 billion moonshot shortly after Dr. Church first pioneered a method of direct DNA sequencing in 1984. The goal? To sequence a single reference genome for humans. Completing the initial aim of that project, Dr. Church and his collaborators and colleagues ultimately set us on a path to where we find ourselves today. Sequencing is now over 10 million fold cheaper, and most people can get their genome sequenced inexpensively if they so desire. But where do we go from there is the question. Arguably one of the most important geneticists of our time, Dr. Church helped initiate the Human Genome Project in 1984 and the Personal Genome Project in 2005. His lab was one of the first that showed CRISPR-Cas9 worked for precise gene editing in normal human cells, and he has been behind countless other scientific innovations and disruptions, specifically in the world of precision genome sequencing. Dr. Church has described the key theme of his lab as technology development, radical transformative technologies. So let's talk about those. George, it's hard to know where to start large genome writing, history, universal donor cells, multiplex editing, and the ability to perform thousands of edits in a single cell, organoids. But maybe we can just start with the Human Genome Project. What is the backstory and how did we get to present day in era of writing? Oh, thank you, Rhonda. Uh, let's, 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 let's see, let's start with uh, uh, the gene, I think we, didn't realize that we were on an exponential when we started sequencing. Uh, I got I got introduced to it uh, through RNA sequencing. There, there wasn't DNA sequencing, and then uh, Wally Gilbert uh, um, uh, was my mentor uh, as a graduate student, and he invented it. Uh, his team in 1977, independently. Fred Sanger published a paper that same year. It took a little longer for the Sanger method to get implemented. But it, what happened was very quickly, uh, we got to a point where um, we were talking about doing a, um, a whole genome, mainly at the Department of Energy's uh, bequest in two, 1984, they, they, they asked a, a harder problem, which was how do you estimate mutation rates as a consequence of energy? And we, we felt, you know, a handful or maybe 10 of 10 scientists in, in what would be, later be called genomics uh, said, well, we can't do that, but what we might be able to do is get one genome, uh, and a reference genome. And then that, but that was, that, that consolation prize was big enough that uh, Charles DeLisi at the Department of Energy just started writing checks. I mean, it didn't wait for an act of Congress or anything, just uh, had uh, money for this kind of R&D because of health effects. Um, and then uh, it took about three years. So, so I, my lab, I, I was transitioning from postdoc to professor, and my lab got one of the first uh, two uh, genome project grants. And then the NIH, it took about three years before the NIH got involved. 
but they got involved in a big way because they, they felt they were a more appropriate uh, vehicle for, for anything health related than the Department of Energy. And they did it kind of in a teamwork with maybe 30% DOE and 70% NIH in the United States component, plus lots of international collaboration, really starting in 1990 uh, with a 15-year goal. Uh, th there was a lot of talk of cutting corners at the beginning. I didn't necessarily call it that, but they were, there was a lot of people trying to do 1x coverage, meaning doing every base pair, exact, reading it exactly once. And I, I didn't like most of these corner cutting things, uh, but I was the most junior member of the project uh, from the beginning. Didn't have a lot of sway. I also felt that um, we should put technology development uh, up front because that could reduce the price and then we could do a lot more than one genome for a lot less than $3 billion. But as soon as, as soon as uh, some of the, the uh, senior members of the visionary team, uh, like Jim Watson, who came in later, um, started representing, you know, getting, drumming up support in Congress, um, it became evident that we would have $3 billion and then, then the motivation for bringing the price down disappeared for a few years, a decade. Um, but it, it did, so with, then instead of some of the corner cutting was to, to not worry too much about repetitive sequences, which in the case of the fruit fly was about half the genome. I mean, oh, you know, it doesn't matter. And uh, uh, at one point they were going to just do the coding regions, uh, which was 1%. Turns out we still haven't identified the 1% coding regions. That would not have been a shortcut. So a lot of these shortcuts were really uh, ill-conceived. But fortunately... Um, we did, we did uh, get a, a decent 92% of the genome and, and, and uh, declared victory. Um, as a sep I, I want to make sure we've got that before we go on to writing genomes as a whole another topic. Do we, do we need more reference genomes? And what are your expectations of finding new tools elsewhere in the evolutionary tree? Well, so uh, yes, we certainly need more uh, genomes. Uh, it's not just the reference, it's the population variation that's important. We want to, uh, the, the variation is at least as important as the reference and it helps us make sure we've got a good uh, reference. So you can call that the reference. It's, it, it's growing uh, recognition that we can represent uh, the reference as a, as a diversity. Um, we, uh, we are finding tools in, in the genomes. So, so one of the thing, one of the nuances that developed the first kind of recommendations for maybe the 1984, 1985, 1986 was the human genome, uh, as if there were one and as if there weren't any other genomes. And, uh, I kept advocating for genome comparisons because when you compare two genomes, that's almost as good as an experiment, but it, but it gives you a, a richer, uh, formulation to, for exploration. And, and we have part of that genome comparison has resulted in new tool discovery. And so it's kind of a positive feedback loop. You, you sequence some genomes, you find some tools, use those to, to read and write genomes, find some more tools and so on. I don't know where that, that ends, but uh, I do think that synthetic biology is probably ultimately unlimited um, while the diversity on Earth, even though it's vast, is is limited, uh, more limited. Um, almost by definition, we can we can explore more than than currently exists, uh, at least in initially in narrow corridors where we're looking at uh, you know specific tool building um, ecosystem uh, restoration and medical consequences. I think. There's a rich field of, uh, you know, let, let, let's say you had one book and that's the only book you had. You could read it and reread it and reread it and you'd keep learning more and more. But as soon as you start writing books, now you got millions of them. So that's, that's how I think of the synthetic biology or writing of genomes. I've, I've read a quote, kind of reminds me of a quote that I read from you that stated, 
I have speculated that essentially everything that we can currently manufacture today without biology, we will be able to manufacture with biology and with potential advantages. Biology is intrinsically atomically precise, and it's scalable to cover the whole planet essentially for free. That's that, pretty revolutionary. I mean, yeah, um, yeah, maybe. Uh, yeah, I mean, you, that's a that's accurate uh, reflection of of how I felt then and how I feel today. Um, why why is it reasonable? Uh, so it they are atomically precise. Uh, it it doesn't biology does not yet gracefully use the entire periodic table or all the chemical bonds that you might want to make out of that periodic pairs of, of elements. Um, but it goes, it comes pretty quick. It, it uses a lot, pretty close. It uses a lot of uh, uh, inorganic bonds that, that, that might surprise some people. So you can make, there are biological systems if you look widely enough. And now we're not talking about necessarily, uh, you know, your enzymatic tools, which might've been implied in the previous, but uh, all, you know, all the things that, all the chemistry and physics that biology uses. They can make fiber optic, things that are fiber optics like in, in sponges. Uh, you can make uh, semiconductors, ferromagnetic materials that, that help it like compass. Uh, there are um, um, all kinds of dichroics and um, gratings and that, that, that generate colors, uh, you know, and um, uh, and the list goes on on the materials that, that are used uh, either naturally or where the, the enzymatic apparatus that is used actually can, if you give it a, a new set of uh, elements, it will incorporate those. Um, you could say misincorporate them, but the point is atomically precise and that, that you can reproducibly make a molecule with thousands of atoms in it and the, and the next molecule over has exactly the size of and atoms in exactly the same configuration, at least, you know, off by less than uh, an atomic bond in length. So, so it's really, this is not something that happens in Silicon Valley or other, you know, worldwide manufacturing of, of silicon-based uh, circuits or in any other inorganic circuits. Uh, it is so far unique to biology. Another thing that's unique to biology is the ability to replicate. So you can make a copy of yourself. So to make a copy, you know, th the idea that a cell phone could make a copy of a cell phone is ludicrous for, so far. Um, but there might be a, a use of a hybrid system where we, we use biological inspiration, electronics inspiration, make hybrid devices that can replicate, use the, the full periodic table um, and do, you know, a few things that, that, uh, electronics is a little bit better at, it's better at telecommunications, uh, at certain wavelengths, uh, um, very hazardous wavelengths like, uh, x-ray and gamma, as well as the, the other end of the spectrum, the radio. Let's talk about how writing the human genome may help us better understand it. So Francis Collins described the working draft of the human genome as the first glimpse of our own instruction book. But today, many scientists believe that to truly understand the instruction book, we also have to write it. Can you explain why that is? Right. Uh, well, I'm not sure I would say have to, but it is certainly very advantageous. Uh, I, I should mention that we don't even have the full instruction book of any human being yet. Uh, we have uh, it, we have the as we declared victory in 2001 on a kind of a rough draft of 92%. Actually, it was considered the, the, the final draft of a, of a rough draft in 2001. It was the final draft in 2004. But it was still haploid, meaning it was just one genome, while all, almost, uh, essentially all of us are uh, diploid, uh, inheritance from mother and father, uh, except for our gametes. Um, so... The, 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 the sequence we have, the one human genome that we have uh, is not of a gamete, it's of a strange haploid cell. So that so that's part of the, but that's not the big barrier to understanding. The big barrier is, as you say, is, is in order to understand how something works and also in order to develop new technologies, you need to be able to, to write and edit and alter and uh, and you understand it because you'll, you'll say, gee, I have no idea. It's, it's like, 
reverse engineering electronic circuit or some software. He said, I have no idea what this code does. Let's let's change it. And and then he said, Oh, that that changes the calendar. Okay, so that that code does calendar. Uh, or in the case of the biology, you'll 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 take a piece out, and now it no longer handles, you know, um, uh, glucose. So you say, Okay, that's part of the glucose monitoring system. And, and you can just get through that and you can get to more and more nuanced changes for discovery's sake, but it's often entangled with not just discovering, but making useful uh, synthetic biology. Um, there, you'll have a, um, a challenge that you'll have out there and that will drive the reading and writing technology forward. It will drive our creativity in terms of how these things can positively influence uh, society and ecosystems. What's the goal of writing a large or a whole genome or an entire chromosome? So um, there, there are a few uh, ideas that, that, have, that have come up where one, where uh, something at a genomic scale is more desirable than a single gene. So a huge fraction of um, recombinant DNA, synth GMOs, and synthetic biology historically has been changing one or two genes. And you don't, it doesn't make sense to synthesize the whole genome if you just want to change one or two genes. But more and more, we're seeing uh, advantages of changing so many genes, you might as well uh, rewrite the thing. And as an example of that, um, we have a project to change the genetic code to make any cell resistant to all viruses. And we just published a paper where we think we did that. Uh, um, uh, and uh, the, the, the way that it works is that the virus, all viruses, uh, as far as we know, depend on the host genetic code, the translation ribosomal machinery. And uh, if you, you can change the code without hurting the host, that the host could be a cell, it could be a, an organism, um, so far, we've only done it in one industrial organism, uh, E. coli. But anyway, if you, ch if you change that enough, the virus can't mutate. Uh, there's so there'd be too many changes that are required to get the virus uh, to, um, to be back to its healthy state. So, um, and we think that this is completely general in that essentially every plant, microbe, and animal on Earth shares a very similar genetic code to one another, and in any case, have a genetic code that they share with the viruses. And if you take it offline, change it enough, like sometimes as few as two codons, um, let's say two codons that code for, for serine, leucine, and arginine are our favorites ones because there's, they have so many codons for each. They're, they're triplets of A, C, G, and T. So, so like AAA codes for lysine, the amino acid lysine. So you ch there's 64 of those, and if you change one, you get a new genetic code. You can change two, and now you get something that's multivirus resistant. Um, so that's an example where you have to make so many changes, tens of thousands of changes on ge genome-wide, and they're interspersed throughout the genome. You might as well just synthesize it, and that's what was done. Um, another example is uh, de-extinction. There, the number of changes you might have to make in order to bring back uh, some physiology like cold resistance uh, and, and all the traits that go along with cold resistance may be scattered and round enough that you're, uh, you can think of it either as highly multiplex editing or as, re as a complete rewrite. And even when you do a complete rewrite, you're not changing every single base pair, all uh, 3 billion times two. Uh, bases, you're leaving them mostly intact. You've, you've chemically synthesized it, but, but it's still useful to think of it as a lot of edits. So, you know, sort of a new, the, our, the maximum number of edits we've done um, by editing, meaning having an enzyme that's targeted at a particular place is 24,000. And the maximum we've done by synthesis is, on the, is almost the same amount, um, although we have synthetic projects which are now getting close to done at 60,000. But then we're gonna take the, the editing up to a million pretty soon. So it, it, they, they go back and forth. There's this a technical uh, one up leapfrogging that goes on between editing and writing of genomes. 
this sort of moonshot goal of changing genomes or writing large genomes in a way, uh, writing, editing them, where, you know, as you mentioned, you make, let's say, you, you take a human cell and in a Petri dish, make it resistant to viruses or, um, you know, make it capable of synthesizing essential micronutri- micronutrients that we usually have to get from our diet. Like, even if it just sits in a Petri dish forever, and that's all, that's all the only place it goes, uh, to me, that's there's something very just fundamentally, you know, awe-inspiring about that. Um, is that is that something, is that kind of a, like, along the lines of uh, your, your thinking with the, with doing some of those things? Yeah, I think, I think the community, uh, the synthetic biology community has responded very, in, in the same kind of awe, uh, uh, inspiring, uh, uh, the, the initiation of this kind of project. I, I hesitate to call it a moonshot because I actually think the moonshot was not as inspiring to me, as the satellites, uh, the the, the uh, GPS satellites, uh, the weather satellites, and the um, um, you know surveillance of of uh, of, of land, and uh, so and the same thing goes for other big projects. The genome project wasn't as impressive to me as the reducing the cost project, a $1,000 uh, genome project, sort of the technology development. And the Manhattan project was certainly not as attractive to me as, say, the projects for uh, nuclear fusion, which could have, all of these things could have started much earlier on. They sound maybe a little bit harder, but they, what they have in common is they're, they're very much more consciously aimed at positive uh, um, societal uh, consequences. And I think it's uh, a little easier to get uh, everybody uh, excited about these sort of things. And I think uh, being able to make uh, industrial microorganisms, uh, plants and animals that are important for ecosystems and agriculture and, and, and human stem cells, they won't stay in that Petri plate. They will make their way into um, um, cell therapies in humans. And if we're going to fix something that's broken um, that you can fix with, with blood cells, you might as well have those blood cells be resistant to all viruses as well, if, if that is shown to be safe and effective by the FDA and in some more organizations. You kind of alluded to this earlier, but how do you think the Vertebrate Genomes Project will affect the field of genetics and biology so the vertebrates genome project, I think, is just indicative of of uh, um, our, our w- wish to sequence the whole uh, biosphere. Um, vertebrates, in particular, are are helpful because they often constitute keystone species in the wild, and and and, and I hope, and I think, there's reason to believe that we will be restoring more and more of. Uh, the non-urban environment to to wilderness. Uh, certainly, you, you can see about a thousand successful rewilding projects, a uh, local rewilding. So, for the most famous one is probably return, restoring the wolves to Yellowstone uh, after seventy years. It had a typical Keystone effect, had a ripple effect that was anticipated and worked out, which was they changed the the uh, abundance of large herbivores, which then changed the abundance of the willows and other trees, which changed the beavers' behavior, which changed the built lakes, which resulted in agric- aquaculture. So, so just w- introducing one vertebrate had all this ripple effect. Um, that's one reason to do it, but there, there are many others. And, and if we, we are causing the extinction of many species. We are also causing the hybridization, which is the creation of new species. It's not clear that we're making extinction faster or more significant than hybrid than new species. Uh, I think our gut feeling is that we are, but it's not proven yet. Uh, but in any case, we need to do that survey to see in detail what we're doing. And in some cases, we need to f- freeze away 
uh, as many organisms as possible. But we, we shouldn't be confused that freezing it away or putting it in a database doesn't mean that it's going to be easy or even possible to restore. Uh, we need to do everything. We, we need to document, freeze, and protect uh, what is already there by shrinking our uh, agricultural use, um, um, possibly by you know ten or a hundredfold. Uh, I think that's totally feasible to do with with uh, synthetic biology and and other new tools that we have. Can you talk about the advantages of perhaps computer aided design of genomes? The sort of aspirational software heart and soul of the genome project, right? So in particular. I'm curious about advances in AI, like those coming out of DeepMind, such as the AlphaFold, and if they have special relevance for this sort of complex work. Right. So, uh, so the genome consists of one uh, percent of it codes for proteins, and uh, and AlphaFold is focused on mostly on the proteins. Uh, but there, are, there's some software for uh, folding RNA and folding even the genome itself, um, that can either be predictive or it can be measured. So there's a lot of software that's used for looking through mi microscopes and uh, determining the structure and trying to correlate that structure, again, by synthetic biology. You say, let's change the shape, not just the sequence, and see how that, see what function that affects. Um, so... And that trial and error can go very quickly or even exponentially. Once you get going, you see, you see the patterns and you start testing more and more sophisticated hypotheses. Um, but uh, AlphaFold is not the, the, the only way to do it. Uh, so there are other machine learning based methods. Uh, in fact, machine learning coupled with multiplex libraries, which can be in the millions or billions of, of uh, synthetic molecules that, that act as that are subtle variations or sometimes not so subtle variations. If you do machines and everything plus mega libraries, you're focusing on functionality rather than on structure. AlphaFold predicts the 3D structure. And to illustrate this, uh, you have, um, let's say you take a, a serine protease. It's called a serine protease because there's a very key serine right at the active site. And that serine has an oxygen that's part of the mechanism. If you change that oxygen, that, that hydroxyl to a hydrogen, it now becomes an alanine and it's completely functionless. But the three-dimensional structure is completely preserved. It is, it is atomically precise throughout the structure, but it's a dead enzyme. So, you, so what's more interesting, I think, for mo most practical applications is st studying what functional um, consequences are of substituting. And that applies not just to proteins, which alpha fold, but also to RNAs and DNAs. Is you want to know what the landscape of functionality is, and that can be done partly by phylogen evolutionary trees, where you line up. We now have tens of thousands of examples of almost every uh, major uh, macromolecule in the cell: proteins, RNAs, and DNAs. And then, um, and then using that, or you can, if you're if you feel that's not enough, that evolution hasn't provided you with enough diversity for your uh, machine learning, you can uh, generate your own data set. So uh, uh, when they were learning chess and Go, they would have the computer play these games against itself to generate more data. Big data is good in the case of machine learning. And in our case, we use these mega libraries, these uh, millions and billions, even trillions, uh, that, that act as a kind of a wetware computer. It, it can do all this computing and you can read it out in terms of uh, the sequencing that you were talking about earlier and uh, barcodes. So you can barcode all these molecules and combinations of molecules. And so you can think of this synthetic biology library as a kind of a, as a honorary computation device that would you use together with the machine learning, which is typically done on a classic von Neumann machine, meaning ordinary kind of computer that most of us would recognize. In your opinion, how has the idea of biology as a software, reading, writing, programming, and debugging sort of held up over time? 
Well, metaphors are imperfect. I, th I, I, I think they're, um, the advantages outweigh the disadvantages of using these metaphors. It, 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 I'm, I'm a programmer since, uh, you know, the mid sixties uh, as a preteen, uh, and, and I've been programming both computers and biology. And I find that the metaphor really works, uh, for me personally, where it breaks down a little bit is um, when you s say that your goals should be set by the goals of the metaphor. In other words, that in the early days of synthetic biology, there were multiple camps. And one of them was the camp where we're going to have NAND gates and OR gates and uh, if then else's and all the Boolean logic uh, that might characterize a certain category of compute computation uh, electronics um, and I and I felt and I still feel that, that that there's a lot to be a lot of interesting biology that occurs with analog circuits uh, and we've kind of lost track that, or some of us have lost track of that key component of electronics um, but it is there but anyway the analogs there's uh, the evolution um, where you, typically when you make a cell phone as far as I know you make a very small number of prototypes that are very similar to one another and you test them out. But in biology, like I've said a couple of times now, you can make billions and trillions and you can do accelerated evolution uh, while with most, you know, bridge building and building trains and jets and cell phones, you, you really don't have that luxury of making trillions of them and seeing which one works best. How, how fast is the field of synthetic biology advancing? Are, are you excited about where the field's going? Um, do you have any concerns or fears? Um, yeah, I would say both, both excitement and concerns. Uh, and I think that that applies to all technologies. I, I, I think that we, the more uh, radical and um, um, destructive, you know, it could be positively disruptive, but you have to think of all the potential negatives. Uh, so it is happening exponentially. How fast? Uh, it doubles it at least once a year. Sometimes we'll get a factor of 10 per year as measured by both reading and writing DNA. Uh, most, of, most of the 10, 20, 30 million fold has occurred within the last decade or two. Um, so it's potentially faster than um, Moore's law for electronics. Uh, and it is, and it, and it has kind of this atomic uh, limit that it's very comfortable. It's very comfortable programming uh, precise atomic uh, positions using biology. Uh, that, that, those sorts of tools um, we've got and we're, we're getting more and more. Now on the negative side, we need to be uh, we have um, good government agencies that, that, that we should be very supportive of, uh, both uh, intellectually and financially, uh, like the FDA, the EPA, the USDA, and their foreign equivalents. Um, these are not sufficient, though, because they're things like equitable distribution of technology. We want everybody on the planet to have, um, at least have a chance to not only theoretically have access to it because the price is right, but also have the education or the dialogue that allows them to evaluate whether they, to know that it exists and to evaluate whether they want to use it or not and whether it's good for them. So it's not sufficient to just like lob over a free piece of software like, uh, you know, GPS, software not and they don't know what the satellites are doing and so forth now modern uses of gps like um uh, google maps is fairly accessible but there's almost no technology that's completely equally accessible you know clean water roads you know um cell phones are are getting accessible in remote parts of the world the only thing that, that i is truly accessible equally that i that I can think of offhand is um, and it is a biotechnology, and that is uh, smallpox. It was it's completely extinct, 
And so you don't have to constantly be uh, bringing out a new drug or a new vaccine that maybe not everybody can afford. Every government can't give out for free. Um, but smallpox uh, extinction is something we can give out for free generation after generation. Um, so I'm looking for more and more of those, so, you know, bringing down the, the price of uh, reading and writing DNA by 10 million fold is just a start. We should look for that in, in almost everything we do with synthetic biology. Do we need the NIH to embrace the, the human genome right project like they did the read or is that sort of already happening? Uh, I think it would be lovely if they did. I think we need to um, pursue multiple routes, uh, philanthropy, industry, government, multiple government. Again, having DOE and NIH in the game was helpful, but there's a number of others that are interested in, in uh, Genome Project Right, um, NSF, um, ARPA, DIAR uh, DARPA and IARPA, um, these, uh, and these have supported it uh, in various forms, have supported synthetic biology. Genome Project Right um, has, you know, been, uh, uh, it's the heir of all those uh, wonderful funding uh, sources. And I think it's, um, but, but it, if it ha as long as it has a, a vision that includes something that, that is uh, net positive for society, that there will be a, a way and hopefully multiple different ways for different uh, flavors of it. And I think one of those, one of the early flagship challenges is this resistance to all viruses in multiple organisms. I think that's something that can be clearly articulated and um, it has a much, I think, a much higher positives than negatives. And in most of the negatives, I think we can mitigate about by um, you know, thinking of all the, all the possible downsides and how to protect against them. So let's, let's take a dive into some of the gene editing tools and, um, and whatnot a little bit. Over the last 10 years since Jennifer Doudna and colleagues first developed uh, CRISPR gene editing, there's been a lot of excitement about it. Uh, your lab was one of the first to show that gene editing using CRISPR-Cas9 could be done in normal human cells. So acknowledging the undoubtedly like revolutionary impact of, of CRISPR, do you think it's possible it's been overhyped from the standpoint of the public at large not having a more comprehensive or appropriate understanding of where it sort of fits within the existing tool sets of synthetic biology? Yeah, I think... Uh... I hesitate to use the word hype because it implies that somebody is being hyperbolic. Uh, I think it was it was kind of a t team effort of of just it's wonderful that we're bringing it any part of uh, reading and writing genomes and and synthetic biology to people's attention or or science for that matter. This is one of the more exciting things in science right now. It's getting people, but it's not it's not just about CRISPR. Uh, I mean, first of all, you can't really edit if you can't read. So I think the big revolution here is being able to read the genomes. You read them at the beginning to, to find the tools. You read them again to decide what your goals of, of editing are. Then you, uh, and then you read it a few times to make sure your, your editing is going well. And then you, then you read it again to, to see that the edit that you made has the physiological consequences, which increasingly it, we're using... DNA reading as a way of, uh, or RNA reading to see how the physiology is going, uh, the so-called epigenomics for physiology. So uh, that reading is important. Another thing that's important is there was some pretty good editing methods that, that are still in use that predate CRISPR, uh, notably uh, homologous recombination, which S Smithies and Capecci got the Nobel Prize uh, for uh, decades before uh, Jennifer and Emmanuel. Um, I'm a big fan of Jennifer Emmanuel, by the way. We've started a, a few companies together, uh, Jennifer and I. Um, th but uh, there's homologous recombination, which is very powerful. It, it's precise and over large distances, while CRISPR tends to be imprecise and, over, and or small in scope. Um, 
Another one that dates back two decades before CRISPR is uh, SSAPs or Lambda Red, it's sometimes called. It's a way of getting precise editing. And, th and that's what we actually used to um, uh, around 2009 to make libraries of billions of edited cells uh, in a day, a single person. Um, so that, that shows some of the power. And the other evidence of its power was that, that was the first completely recoded genome was done mostly a combination of uh, SSAPs and um, recombinases, which is also very, very precise. Uh, CRISPR was basically a, a hatchet, and I sometimes call it genome vandalism. So I, I, I think we need to embrace all of these methods, though, and a few more that are, that are coming uh, now. Uh, deaminases that can be done with and without CRISPR um, and more sophisticated SSCPs and, and uh, integrases, transposonases. So it's a rich, uh, I think it's okay if the public just latch, latches on to one aspect of it, um, but it'd be nice, it, it is nice whenever uh, a more nuanced and, and visionary form uh, where it illustrates the importance of reading and uh, other more precise uh, and larger scale editing and writing uh, where you write, synthesize something from scratch and usually pop it in by some, um, could be popped in by CRISPR, but more commonly it's popped in using recombinases or integrases. What about some of the um, existing capabilities of, you know, gene editing therapy, you know, things that have been done, you know, in you know, transgenic models for, you know, a, a decade at least or more, um, you know, so deleting versus addition versus, you know, of a miss yeah. missing gene. Right. So, uh, yeah, so you can think of uh, CRISPR as a subset of editing. Editing is a subset of genome engineering uh, and genome engineering can, is not a subset of, but it's a kind of a Venn diagram overlapping set with therapies and uh, GMOs and so forth. So uh, most gene therapies that have been approved uh, are adding genes. And this is done typically without CRISPR. And, and um, uh, you know, when you have a genetic disease, you're missing a gene, so you don't really want to edit necessarily, you want to um, add it back in. As you, as you grow older, uh, a lot of your gene products, your gene expression is dropping down. One way to deal with that would boost it back up. And we've, we've explored um, these sorts of things. Um, the, the use of uh, gene therapy putting in a, a missing gene uh, and in fact editing for that matter uh, for, for rare genetic diseases is by its nature expensive. Uh, it, it's millions of dollars per person over a lifetime, um, partly because the R&D costs and the palliative care and, and all sorts of health care for someone who has a very severe disease that, that might have died young um, years ago, but thanks to the Orphan Drug Act and others, uh, they, they can now uh, lead uh, closer to normal life, but, but at millions of dollars. Uh, there is, um, it's great to have, we'll keep developing these gene therapies and better ways of delivery. Oh, I forgot to mention delivery is another thing that's sometimes missed when people just shout CRISPR. Uh, you have to get it to the right place, the right dose, the right time. Um, maybe to turn off when it's done its job. At the, so keep it off target, keep it off target so minimum. So anyway, the, the, this de, uh, delivery, an alternative to this expensive solution is a much more, a much lower cost one, which is genetic counseling, where you basically uh, tell people before they get married, before they, uh, before preconception, um, or sometimes post-conception, that they, um, that they're at risk, um, they themselves are carriers. They will be, they are healthy, they will be healthy. But if, if they um, marry someone that has the same carrier status, um, they, they put their children at risk. So, so there's, 
the, the, there are two methods. I think a lot of the Western world tends to go towards the interventionist, you know, reactive medicine where we'll spend millions of dollars, in, you know, by not pursuing preventative medicine. But the preventative medicine in this case is, you know, low hundreds of dollars um, just to, to, to know yourself, to know um, uh, how, to, how to keep your children healthy by uh, making preconception choices. We'll probably circle back to a little bit more of that in a minute, but since we're, we're talking about, uh, you mentioned a few other types of, you know, gene editing, the deaminase, and you've talked about this multiplex editing. I, what does it mean to be able to go, you know, to performing 26,000 edits or you said, I mean, a million, potentially a million edits in human cells, you know, versus the previous record of something like 62? I mean, what applications does this most impact? Is it you know, the large genome creation or tissue engineering or germline. Right. So we, we did our, our, our previous record of 62 or 42, depending on how you count it, uh, was in pigs. And it was for tissue engineering. It was germline. Uh, so germline is kind of off the table for human, in part because there, there's no clearly articulated medical need. Uh, and the, the time for discovering safety and efficacy is over a lifetime, which is, you know, unaffordable and ill-advised. So anyway, but germline certainly work gets into humans via um, uh, pigs. Uh, so so the, the, this has been the idea of transplanting organs from animals to humans goes back at least to the 1960s, where uh, a, a chimpanzee kidney survived for nine months in a, in a, in a school teacher uh, who went back to teach and, you know, was normal for nine months. Um, but that was, that was the exception then. And it would, and it would, it would be the exception now, except for the synthetic biology that we do on the germ line of pigs, which now made it into, uh, many, uh, preclinical, uh, primate trial, primate, uh, transplant trials, pig to tri primate and a few uh, pig to human trials that are going on. Primate survival looks like around 600 days so far, and there's still uh, a couple of them are still alive uh, at 500, 600 days. Um, but we're going to we're keep improving these. Um, but that's that's in the order of 40 to 60 uh, edits per genome in the germline. Uh, if the the multivirus resistance requires more than that. Uh, the, um, uh, some things that are done for, uh, diversity and ecosystem, um, ma maintenance may involve even more. Uh, there are, uh, a type of tape recorder, sometimes called a flight recorder. So it's analogous to planes that, that record a lot of data, but typically you don't read it. So a lot of writing, not much reading unless the plane goes down and then then you'll look at you'll look at selective regions for debugging what went wrong. That same thing could be put into the uh, bodies of plants, animals, and and even humans, um, to, because it's a very compact recording device of the physiological states of every cell in the body. And we've and we've we've shown this works sort of in the scale of sixty to twenty four thousand, and that's that's probably our neck our our first effort at, at making a million edits will be in these, in the form of these molecular flight recorders. So those are a few examples, but the number will grow as soon as, as soon as we get more than a handful of people working on, on these, uh, visionary projects. Um, um, what we'll see, uh, a blossoming of all sorts of creative uses of, of making uh, multiplex editing. I think, non-multiplex editing will become the exception. So you're, as you mentioned, your lab, you know, gene edited pigs and you enhance them by making them resistant to some retroviruses. Do you think, you know, as a more visionary kind of question that you could use, you know, more precise gene editing, the deaminase or CRISPR, or whatever, to eliminate viral spillover events from livestock to humans. So, I mean, there's a lot of viruses that originate from 
from livestock when we're raising animals right. in, in captivity. So, uh, yes, I, this is, uh, important. Um, so the, 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 the viruses that we got rid of were endogenous retroviruses, meaning they're built into the pig genome of every pig on the planet. And so, and they are, have been shown to infect human cells and to replicate and go into other human cells. So this is particularly, um, bad scenario, uh, in immune compromised patients and the FDA recognized this decades ago and really was, I think, pleased to see progress being made on eliminating them from the germline of the pigs. So that's that there, but in addition to viruses that are built into the germline of the, of animals and humans, uh, there are viruses coming in from outside. And we just published uh, the first example. This is with Lu Han Yang's uh, team. She was a graduate student and a postdoctoral fellow in my lab and co-founded uh, eGenesis and Kihan for making cell therapies and organ therapies. But anyway, as a side project, um, we published a paper on uh, getting rid of African swine fever virus by making CRISPR to attack the viral DNA. This is um, what, what CRISPR originally evolved to do is to, is to take out uh, bacterial viruses. We think this is the first case of using CRISPR in a practical sense for uh, eliminating mammalian um, viruses from the environment. Um, it's, it's using CRISPR against mammalian viruses. So, uh, but zoonotic diseases uh, is bigger than that. If we could bake uh, a huge fraction of, the, of plants, animals, and humans resistant to those viruses because of their genetic code, that actually anticipates viruses we haven't even seen yet. Uh, it should handle all natural viruses. Um, so like, um, you know, Marburg, Ebola, Ebola uh, HIV, CRISPR, these should not have been, these would not have been surprises. They would have been surprises to the scientists, but not to um, these cancer resistant, oh, sorry, uh, virus resistant cells. So it sounds like CRISPR seems to be uniquely positioned to, for that, you know, type of uh, use. Well, application. I, not necessarily. So I don't, uh, you know, I like to, I love CRISPR. I, uh, I personally benefited from it, but it, it is, uh, um, I like to balance it. That there are other nucleases that some people claim are more specific, less off target. Uh, there are deaminases that don't involve CRISPR. Um, so I wouldn't say you, I w you, you, term unique is too strong. Uh, we have a lot of tools in the toolbox and, uh, um, in, you know, and it, it, a lot of it has to do with, um, delivery and testing too. Testing is a big deal, which is somewhat swept under the rug uh, when we're just, it's just like, all we have to do is design a, a you know, a CRISPR and take care of everything. But there's a lot of reading and uh, right, you know, synthesis, which isn't CRISPR and, and then the, the, the delivery and testing. So it's, it's a integrated whole that doesn't require CRISPR. So another technology would be base editing, which, uh, you know, doesn't involve double stranded breaks and DNA. Right. And I know there's a uh, phase one B trial with the PCSK9 target, they're targeting yes. it, gene targeting it for the liver as a, a potential right. treatment for the hypercholesterolemia of familial yes. form. Um, I'm, I'm, you know, I just read about this recently and pretty excited. I mean, I've, you know, I know people that are, that are taking the anti PCSK9 antibodies, which are, are very expensive. Um, and, uh, you have to get them every two to four weeks. So, uh, It'll be interesting to see, you know, if the base editing could be a one and done treatment, do you think, or, uh, that, that is one of the advantages of gene therapy in general, whether it's editing or, or adding genes. Um, uh, I, I, yeah, I think that a lot of, a lot of our diseases are diseases of, of wealth. I mean, we used to have much more active uh, vegan diets, um, uh, low, you know, low in overall carbohydrates, mainly because it was just low in calories altogether. Um, and so diabetes and, 
uh, in some of the cardiovascular diseases didn't affect us. Also, we didn't live as long in general, uh, so it was less of an issue. So these are, but 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 PCSK9 is a it looks like it's shaping up to be a terrific uh, example um, of something that basically all humans can be thought of as having the same disease, and therefore it's a large market could be low cost. Aging is another or a variety of age-related diseases that might have a common core where we are programmed to die at a certain age. The mice die at two years old, bowhead whales at 200, humans somewhere in between. And so that's probably negotiable. Um, uh, PCSK9 is, a, is not solving aging in general. It's, it's a very specific um, thing that may be common to most hu humans. It was de-risk because there were a few humans that were walking around that were basically double null for both copies of their PCSK9 from mom and dad. And that, that kind of showed us that it was going to be safe and effective. Um, although there's still quite a bit of study, long-term studies that have to be shown to make sure it doesn't cause early um, onset neurodegeneration in the particular way that we're uh, implementing it, which is not germline, which is how it the uh, people that previously had PCSK nulls, not nulls for germline via natural mutations. Since you mentioned aging, uh, and it sounds like, and I think you think aging is fundamentally a program, it's, it's a really interesting idea, one that's probably, it's got many implications. So um, whether, especially when we're thinking about whether or not we can mitigate aging or potentially cure it. So could you talk about your perspectives on that and what you think it might mean for the future of human aging? Well, so what we're uh, mostly aiming for is serious diseases of aging. They may, they, they may have very relatively little in common in terms of what organ is affected, you know, what system. There may be nine or ten different pathways that can be affected, so-called hallmarks of aging. Um, so there's a great diversity, but they have we, there is a school of thought that they have it and a small core set of systems biology, systems medicine, that if you get at that core, you can, you can change the clock. You can make it shorter, uh, as in mice, or longer as in bowhead whales. And, and, and then you can rejuvenate. Uh, there is rejuvenation that occurs whenever you go through gametogenesis and fertilization, sort of normal reproduction. Uh, you reset the age clock. And you also reset it when you do something unnatural, which is cloning, where you take the nucleus from an old uh, animal and put it into a rejuvenating environment of, a, of an egg. Um, there's, and there's also a rejuvenation process that occurs unnaturally when you use transcription factors. These are DNA binding proteins that regulate the expression of genes. Four of them, so-called Yamanaka factors, or so OSKM is the abbreviation. Um, these uh, will very convincingly take a very old cell and turn it into a very young cell. Meaning, like uh, say a skin cell from a 80-year-old, and it will be it will take on many of the characteristics, most of the significant characteristics of an embryonic cell, and that it can um, produce almost all the tissues of the, of the body, probably all of them, uh, except for the um, extra embryonic and the parts that aren't part of the body that, that contribute to the early embryogenesis. So, um, so those are a few, uh, and there are many others. It's shown that, that the blood, uh, what's in the blood of older and younger animals can influence one another. The older blood makes the younger ones old, and the young blood makes the older animals younger by a variety of uh, biomarkers and uh, disease-related things. And so, so, so I, I, I fall into the school. There's two school, at least two schools of thought here. That there's a damage school where you have to go in there and kind of micromanage a surgery to fix the damage, as a surgeon might fix a damaged broken arm. Uh, and then, then there's the... Uh, epigenetic school where it says that if you convince the cell that it's young, it will fix itself uh, to a large extent. There will be some exceptions. Um, and, and so, and we've seen that uh, over and over these, you know, 
fertilization, cloning, and uh, OSKM factors uh, are, are three, and the bloodborne factors are four examples. Uh, and we need to reset all of the uh, mechanisms, all nine hallmarks of aging in probably all of the tissue types of the body, at least the stem cells for each of the body parts uh, to have a shot at. Um, and we're aiming for, for youthfulness, uh, lack of age-related diseases. So, so you should be youthful at an age which you, where you normally would be um, unhealthy, uh, even if you're not um, dying of any particular disease. So that's, that's what we're aiming for. It, it will be approved by the FDA for specific indications for specific diseases of aging. But then if it really is getting at the core of aging, it will be immediately applicable to almost all of the diseases of aging. And, and does aging just it, uh, affects everything, almost every morbidity, mortality, even like accidental uh, death, um, infectious diseases like COVID has a very, and, and its cognitive consequences have very steep um, increases um, at around 60 years old. So I, I, I recall like one of your, your former publications, I forgot what year, I think it was a PNAS one where you, you did gene therapy and added three transcription factors to, to rodents, to mice. And uh, there was some reversal of, of aging or biomarkers. Um, uh, and uh, it was like TGF beta receptor and um, FGF21 and uh, alpha clotho. Uh, yeah, those three. Clotho, yeah. Th so, those were not transcription factors, those were soluble factors. Okay. That's right. That's right. Um, okay. But we also did a separate experiment where we took three transcription factors, OS and K of OSKM, um, separate experiments. Uh, but delivered in similar ways, uh, adeno-associated virus. And we did some other experiments with folostatin and telomerase, so that affects the ends of the chromosomes of telomeres. Folostatin is um, mostly muscle aim. But each of these has um, uh, you know, uh, re reproducible impact on hall of hallmarks of aging, of biomarkers of aging, and diseases of aging. Um, and it affects multiple diseases, about seven different categories of diseases that we've done now in mice. And some uh, a subset of those have been tested in dogs now, aiming for a veterinary product. Um, the three that you mentioned, I think, have slight advantages. Uh, the the fibroglass FGF21 and TGF beta. I should mention it, that is an art. The, the other two are natural, alpha clotho and fiber FGF um, 21. But the TGF beta uh, receptor is normally membrane bound, but we made a soluble form of it. So all three of them tend to be soluble and they effectively uh, act like the, the young blood in, reju in rejuvenating these mice and dogs. And hopefully soon they'll be in human clinical trials. Um, and, it, and that has the advantage that we don't yet have a good way of delivering to every cell in the body or every stem cell in the body. Um, remember I said delivery was very important and, we're, and it's so important we haven't, uh, we, we need to fix it. Uh, but anyway, in the meantime, we can d deliver the genes to a subset of cells in various parts of the body. And then those subset will deliver the proteins, those three proteins you mentioned more broadly, and so you can, in principle, affect the whole body by that combination of two kind of tiers of delivery. Um, so that, that, that's the idea behind that. And the, and the dogs is a particularly good conduit to humans because they're, they're large mammals like humans. They live often in a human environment, eat human, like sometimes eat human food. Uh, they have similar kind of emotions and bonding and eye contact and all the rest. So it's, uh, and, and the owners can really sense their, their states so they can get it more subtle, um, positive and negative consequences earlier. So anyways, and, and it's a product uh, that people care deeply about their, their pets. So, so, uh, I'm very excited about, you know, rejuvenate bio and Noah Davidson was a postdoc on my lab and he started 
rejuvenate bio and it, it seems to be shaping up to be a good product line. Yeah, it'll be exciting to follow this results. Was, you kind of answered one of my questions, which was, you know, a lot of the the rodent research, particularly with aging, it it not 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 a lot of it translates, you know, to humans. And and you know, one thing in particular, I think that uh, is is important to consider with human aging, is that you know humans are exposed to disease and viruses. We're not in this like sterile lab environment, and we have these periods of real like illness and muscle disuse, and um, it, it's just very different than than a rodent. But there's advantages to to studying to using rodents, right? What 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 do you think? Like why why should we use rodents to to, to study aging? Well, so. Uh... So as the prelude to the experiment that you, you mentioned, where we used three, three uh, soluble factors in dogs, we did, we did 45 different gene therapies singly, one at a time, in rodents, um, mice, to make sure to find the subset of three that we wanted to test in rodents in combinations, various combinations. And then once we had settled on the three factors out of 45, then we moved into dogs, and then we'll, we'll next move into humans. So uh, you shouldn't blindly expect the, the rodent model to work, but it, it, it's, it's, they're advantageous because they, they only live two years, so, so it's easy to see um, a longevity effect. Uh, we're not always looking for longevity. We're, we're usually looking for aging, reversal of age-related diseases, because that's what the FDA wants as well. But... We do occasionally measure longevity. In the case of the folostatin and TERT uh, treatments, those did show a pretty significant, very significant um, longevity effect on the on the rodents. Um, so uh, even even primate trials can be deceptive. There's a lot of differences um, in the way that they're treated. The you know the, the it's just in fact, in certain ways, dogs have, I think, a more similar environment, maybe, uh, you know, more to their liking, uh, more natural for them um, since they've been our companion for tens of thousands of years. So, uh, but even dogs are not an ideal. Uh, larger, you know, pigs are very close to humans in their organs. That's why they're being used as transplants, but they're also imperfect. So, so an alternative to all of the animal models is uh, human organoids, um, and and those are getting increasingly accurate. Uh, so we can basically skip a lot of the developmental biology and go straight to a particular organ. Uh, we can't go, we can't go via normal human development because there's a ban on letting human embryos develop past 14 days in a dish. Um, but it's considered ethical to make an isolated heart or even heart plus lungs, plus muscle, plus li liver, plus neurons, you, uh, but not a whole brain. <laughs> uh, and, you know, so, so we're, we're as, as this is rapidly developing, we're exploring collectively with a diverse set of voices, you know, what... Uh, how to do this in a way that's um, humane uh, to the animals, or um, or develop all you know completely animal independent um, strategies for both testing therapies, but also being the therapies. Uh, the organoids uh, are increasingly moving their way into um, into clinical trials. So, for example, we showed uh, restoration of a um, demyelinating disease in, in rodents by putting human organoids, brain organoids that contain, that remyelinate and are protected against the demyelinating mechanism. So they're super cells and that they are not just replacing the cells that were damaged because they just get damaged themselves, but they are resistant to the damage. Uh, and that's, and I think that there's repeated over and over again in, in both cell therapies and organ therapies we're developing is that the goal is not just to deal with the organ shortage um, or it, it's to have something that's enhanced. It's immunologically um, superior, that it, less rejected, um, resistant to pathogens, resistance to cancer and senescence, 
cryopreservation. All of these things have been demonstrated in animals, and now we want to either get them into humans via um, cell or organ transplants. You, if I remember correctly, you were you en you enhanced the the brain organoid to I think you edit it from ApoE four, which if you're homozygous, you have like a twenty fold increased risk for Alzheimer's to ApoE three. Right. What so, so uh, making it more resilient against Alzheimer's, I guess. Right. Uh, Correct. So, so that's uh, somewhat depending on how you look at the composition of of various genes. Uh, that particular case, E4, is not the predominant allele. And so uh, you might call it an enhancement. PCSK9 uh, is very rare in the population. And so you, if you make everybody or a large fraction of the population PCSK9 negative, uh, that could be called an enhancement relative to the average. But it's not an enhancement relative to the minority. In the case of uh, ApoE3 or even ApoE2, uh, which, which is, that is... Uh, rarer than the E3 plus E4, and it, that would be an enhancement. But E3 over E4 is probably about uh, closer to average. But, but this whole definition of, uh, or this whole obsession about enhancement seems odd because a huge fraction of our popular technologies are enhancements. You know, our, our smartphone makes us smarter in a certain way. It can also make us dumber. But uh, the point is it has the capability of you know, helping us navigate, help you know, getting access to the world's um, facts and factoids, uh, cars, jets, and so forth, enhance our ability to, to uh, locomote. So, uh, so I think increasingly we're going to recognize that the biotechnologies we're producing are not just reactive medicine where we're putting out fires, it, they're preventative medicine where we're, um, by enhancement, we're protecting ourselves, like vaccines uh, is, a, is a beautiful example of enhancement that protects us. Uh, we're, we're far healthier than our ancestors were because of uh, vaccines. I, I kind of would like to just move into a little bit to, to, the, to the germline editing. We've kind of talked, yeah. alluded to it a little bit here and there, but um, I, you've, you've said in, in previously that you felt like an obligation to be balanced. Right. And uh, but you've also, of course, said it's important to focus on outcomes um, and not to rationalize addictions to future. And uh, you're even involved in calling for a, a temporary moratorium on germline editing. Um, no, talk, actually, no. I was I was not I, I, I was opposed to the the obsession with moratorium because we already have a moratorium on all new drugs. Uh, we don't put ring. We don't allow anybody to use new drugs. Uh, that haven't been through the FDA testing. And um, so, yeah, so it, it sounds subtle, but uh, I, I was uh, concerned that we would be developing germline where there's no need, but there's also no need for a moratorium <laughs> because we have very good uh, regulatory mechanisms for preventing that sort of thing from, from happening at a market scale. Now, a moratorium would not do anything more at the market scale and also would not do anything more at the individual scale. Both the FDA and, and in fact, most laws do not work on individuals that want to break the laws, that are willing to accept the consequences or think they're above the consequences. So, and that's what happened in the case of germline. Someone either misinterpreted willfully uh, the, the guidelines or um, didn't, didn't think it was a law. And in fact, he didn't get convicted of germline manipulation. This is J.K. He in China. He got convicted of, you know, not following the rules for um, uh, get, getting the consent of the funding agencies and the patients and so forth. He, he actually did a pretty good job of getting the consent um, by some criteria. Uh, he spent an hour of videotaped uh, counseling uh, to make sure they understood what they were getting into. But uh, anyway, as far as I know, he was not convicted of germline therapy, um, but something more uh, nuanced. And he's out now. He's, it's, it's, it's been the three years is up uh, and he's out. And the, as far as we know, the children are healthy, which is more than you can say for the most 
uh, revolutionary new treatments. So I, I, that's what I mean by balance. Is let's let's talk about what did he actually do that was harmful to the patients or harmful to society, um, rather than just having a knee jerk response. We were all uh, coiled up, ready to say that uh, he he actually did try to to uh, pay attention to the ethics, but there wasn't an a, there wasn't a clear ethical consensus beyond the National Academy of Sciences report that I participated in in a minor way. He, uh, he was trying to go down their checklist, but he was doing it sort of, he's being the judge of whether he was uh, doing the checklist right or not. I think that rubbed people the wrong way. And I think the Chinese government was very sensitive to what international opinion would be. It's not clear they would have acted quite so harshly uh, if there had been no international backlash. They might have nominated him for a Nobel Prize in a parallel universe. A couple of questions come to mind there. I mean, the rea- the public rea- international reaction. I mean, the differences in in the public response. You know, in 1978, the first it was Louise Brown was the was the first uh, a baby born uh, as yeah. conceived by in vitro fertilization and considered one of the biggest medical breakthroughs of the 20th century. Uh, but uh, I, presumably at the time it was quite controversial and um you know i'm just sort of interested in the in the in the res- public response to that sort of medical technology and use of it versus the crispr edit of babies in 2018 if, if they were like yes. proportional S- well well i think that uh this concern about um this uh about doing things that are unnatural uh, happens again and again, and, and and natural is is often it's not defined as the way the world was before humans. It's usually it's the way our grandparents lived. It's there's some kind of nostalgic uh, uh, reification of of the way our grandparents lived, even though we weren't there. You know, we just imagine that they had a perfect life without antibiotics or. Uh, um, motors or <laughs> that sort of thing. And um, so what's natural keeps is a moving target. And a lot of things that were uh, demonized, villainized in the past are taken for granted now. You know, for example, some of us might remember how cell phones were demonized as melting your brain or, you know, you know giving uh, radiation to your brain. And uh, but now people are on cell phones all day and they don't even use landlines anymore. Uh, and you could even say, so anyway, the, the, the um, re, you know, the response is, uh, is one of caution. Uh, the appropriate response is we're going to cautiously take this to the food and drug administration. Um, but that requires that the government allows us to take the Food and Drug Administration, which right now uh, we can't do because a 2016 writer says we can't even uh, uh, allow, allow the FDA to accept these um, nominations for, for clinical trials. So this is a very you know head in the sand kind of approach to science. Usually that the the be careful, and, and most FDA trials are very carefully vetted before they go in. Preventing of that careful uh, accumulation of data could cause lives. Um, I don't think it's urgent with the case in the case of germline. No one has articulated a particular thing other than HIV resistance, which is what JK, J, I think was actually a pretty good choice of CCR5 and HIV resistance in JK Ho's case. Um, I think some people maybe don't appreciate how stigmatizing HIV can be in certain communities in China. So um, anyway, it's, it's a complicated issue uh, that I think we need to be respectful of, uh, of both the, the potential future and the path, safe path towards it. How do you think we can uh, equip people with the right knowledge in order to come to you know well reasoned conclusions surrounding germline editing, editing, um, you know, 
understandings of complexity. So we've got, you know, background mutational rate and, and offspring impact. I mean, if you compare it to, to you know, again, a background mutational rate um, or a paternal chemo, right? You know, if a man goes and, and you know, he gets cancer and he gets treat, treatment and then after the treatment goes off and, and has a child, um, you know, we, we kind of accept that, you know, mutational rate. Uh, so things that are known about germline mutagens, I guess. Right. I mean, uh, chemotherapy is a, a perfect example, uh, or, or the radiation you get um, living at high altitude. Um, it, this falls into what I was saying about nature or natural, which is the, you know, defined as whatever we've accepted, whatever technology we've accepted up to this point uh, are natural and any new one. So chemotherapy is okay, even if it's more mutagenic than um, gene therapy. Uh, I don't think we're, we necessarily have to educate people or, or establish what the right answer is. Uh, I think it's about conversation. And some of those, you know, some, sometimes people say, well, you know, you need to, you know, reach out to everybody. Well, the thing is, a lot of people you read out to aren't particularly interested. They don't have the time to have a uh, a discussion about some abstract science that isn't in the supermarket. Uh, so, um, so that's that's one issue. One way to make that connection, though, is with more common media like um, you know um, books and movies, uh, television. These 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 are things where you can put it in a framework that's entertaining and, and educational. Um, you know, um, my, my wife, for example, contributed to the, the uh, Gray's Anatomy uh, Genome Lab uh, episodes. So uh, um, that's one that's one form of dialogue where they can say, "Oh, yeah, we're we're worried about Jurassic Park." Uh, there's no reason to avoid the negative scenario. Some of my colleagues don't like uh, negative. Uh, painting of scientists and, and entertainment, but I think it's, it's good. It protects us from it, sort of those scenarios and slight generalizations of scenarios. And the more we think of, the more we're protected. Um, there's, I think the way that germline, if germline gets accepted, the way that uh, in vitro fertilization was eventually uh, accepted, it was, it was demonized too. The whole term test tube babies, which we think is quaint now, was supposed to be scary back then in the 70s. Test tube babies, you know, it's like, that's totally unnatural. But now, you know, uh, it is millions of, uh, I think six million babies have been born that way, um, including some of my close colleagues. So um, I think the may, way it may make it into a popular acceptance, so it's, it's considered natural and the next thing is unnatural, is number one is if we're already getting humans that are getting transplants from germline manipulated pigs. So if germline is, is not hurting the, the herds of pigs that are providing all these organs and, the, and it's not hurting the patient that's getting the organ, then maybe that's one way. The other way is we'll, get, we'll have more and more gene therapies that are somatic, not germline, but they're done at early age, maybe to, to cure you know, early onset uh, childhood diseases. And so we, or maybe even done in fetuses, but not in germline. So people will say, oh yeah, you can do it really, really early um, in utero. What are we really worried about? And, and some of these gene therapies, as people start to get to be quite old, will say, okay, it doesn't have long-term consequences. And then, and then somebody will come up with a use case that is very compelling where someone has a very serious medical disease, might be infertility, might be something more fatal than that. Uh, and, and then uh, that will be the tipping point, uh, if there is a tipping point. Could be that it has to do with something that we all share in common uh, that's very hard to fix in adults. Um, the, the problem is there are very few examples of that. M you know, maybe space travel requires some effort in the germline, but even that, uh, you know, we might be able to, 
make every cell in the body radiation resistant. Maybe we can make some kind of multiplex edited uh, solution to low gravity. Um, so I think uh, maybe we can make a multiplex edit that makes us multivirus resistant. These are things where you think it might be germline, but it might be just as it might be just as feasible, or at least feasible enough. It might maybe maybe be more expensive, less equitably distributed. The nice thing about germline is every subsequent generation gets it for free. So uh, some people say that's a bug or a, a feature, depending how you look at it. But uh, but if you can do it, it, uh, it will get cheaper to do it somatically, and it will be inherited in the way that, that we used to mean inheritance, which is uh, what your great-grandfather hands down to the great-grandchildren, uh, a set of technologies, tools, possessions. Um, that multiplex editing will be something that won't be germline, but it will be just as surely inherited. Right. The equality of access is, is, is interesting, as you've brought up uh, multiple times, because, you know, like HIV is great because, I mean, HIV is essentially cured with the right drugs and most developing people live in developed countries with, you know, healthcare uh, can do that. But it's that's not the case for, you know, developing nations with uh, governments that aren't, um, you know, running correctly. And so uh, it, it's an interesting point that it you know, is it easier to genetically cure uh, HIV through the germline or, you know, eliminate poverty, essentially, when you're when you're talking about something, I mean, potentially, I guess. Yeah, I think I think um, eliminate poverty sounds like a moonshot, but it, it but I think it qualifies as a as a positive grand challenge, more like the satellites than the moonshot. Uh, and, it, and it may not be so uh, far off. In that there's a there could be a virtuous site positive feedback loop where uh, you reduce the medical load from infectious disease and other diseases uh, that that slow down not just the individual that has a disease but the whole family whole village around that person because they want to they care for that person and uh, and then that that l l lightening of the medical load results in a little more time and money to dedicate to things like educating um, children, um, adult women, and so forth. And then that results in better medical care, and it just gets better and better. And it could, it could uh, help. The other thing that could help is you know, better agriculture, maybe less uh, use of land and water for animals and more on nutritious plants. Um, golden rice is an example of something uh, where vitamin A deficiency kills uh, a million people a year. Um, and golden rice is one cost effective way of reducing the poverty burden, you know, to a to town with a, a few blind people that were likely to go be dead within a year or two of, of going blind. But um, uh, so anyway, I think I think that the, the diseases of poverty um, can be eliminated, and um, in that manner, uh, we also uh, could, in principle, HIV is one of the infectious diseases that is mostly human specific. Even though a lot of these so-called human specific diseases did come from an animal originally, I mean, where did where else did it come from? Um, but it's so rare that if you eliminated it. That you know, the, the it would be essentially extinct, like smallpox. I mean, there could be another pox virus that replaces smallpox someday. But the point is, the smallpox has been eliminated for so many decades that it is unquestionably a success. And I think the same thing could be done with HIV. Uh, you know, con um, condoms is uh, another thing that that works a little bit better uh, in the industrialized nations. Uh, it doesn't really necessarily protect against uncooperative partners or rape, that sort of thing. So uh, I think we need, there's a, there's a multi-pronged effort to uh, eliminate HIV, but once we do, it could be like smallpox. It's been recalcitrant to vaccines, which are so powerful. Um, the latest round of vaccines are, are kind of in a format of gene therapy, 
and are uh, very inexpensive compared to most gene therapies that are typically $2 million. In the case of COVID-19, there was as little as $2 for a adenoviral caps that are around the double-stranded DNA for three of the top five vaccines. You, you talked a little bit about uh, genetic counseling and, um, you know, there's, there's next generation embryo selection. And I'm sort of, I'm interested in, in your thoughts and the practical and or phys- ph- uh, philosophical differences between, you know, doing next generation embryo selection and germline editing. Um, I guess put it another way, you know, does advances in sequencing and understanding of the genetics of disease and complex traits, polygenic traits, eventually lead to a point of practical editing through embryo selection? I think it will be intermediate. It won't, will, it won't be as powerful as one could do with uh, uh, germline um, genome engineering. Um, but it, 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 it could achieve many of the same goals for, you know, uh, eliminating certain diseases. Um, uh, many of those diseases that could, that could be eliminated by in vitro fertilization and embryo choice could also be eliminated or greatly reduced, um, by, uh, preconception choices if that were more common. It's, it's really a matter of social norms. So um, there's a tiny sector of society that uh, practices preconception decision-making and they and those have almost eliminated uh, major um, serious genetic diseases. Why it isn't common in other parts of society is a complicated uh, socioeconomic educational, cultural issue. Um, but I, I think it, there will be a tipping point where people realize, you know, get to know their own genome better, get to know their choices um, when they're still very young and dating. Uh, and there's a whole variety of ways it could, it could work out um, so, so that things are done before the point of in vitro fertilization, which, which is not a it's not the most pleasant uh, medical procedure. I mean, uh, the hormone treatments uh, have uh, negative consequences for quite a few women. Sometimes it has to be repeated multiple times, sometimes six times in the case of one of my colleagues was the result of six rounds of IVF. Um, So uh, But you, uh, but the number of embryos that could be made by in vitro fertilization could skyrocket um, without in any way interfering with the germline and so forth uh, by um, epigenetically reprogramming cells to become pluripotent stem cells, and then the pluripotent stem cells can become uh, eggs, um, and then those eggs. They, may, they might be randomly mutated, and if you sequence enough of them, you'll find one that is um, what you want. So it's, you haven't induced the mutation with CRISPR. It just happened the way it happens in the world. Um, this is far from efficient compared to editing, but it, is, it illustrates how we have this kind of double standard that if you do it, if you achieve the same goal, germline engineering, this way it's okay, this way it's not okay. It's the same as GMO argument. That if you get if you mutate, uh, you know, a tomato or a soybean by random ultraviolet mu- mutation, where you're making hundreds of mutations at random with no control, that's somehow more attractive than if you do a precise edit and you make sure the rest of the genome is clean and you haven't touched anything else. It just doesn't, you know. For some people that makes sense, for other people it doesn't. Uh, it's like saying that oh, if I'm going to you know, fix my car engine, I'm going to, you know, throw all kinds of random chemicals and shotguns and, and stuff into it and hope that, that one of those things makes the right uh, fix to the car. Um, but anyway, the, the, I, I think that's what's, what's going on in germline is very similar to what's going on in, in GMOs. You can, you can radically change this, the plant species by one method, but not by another. You can 
you can change an embryo's fate um, by, you know, negatively with chemotherapy or positively by IVF, but not by germline editing. It's, it's, it's double think. It's, it's, uh, yeah, it's good, good topic of conversation. And, and, and eventually I think it will sort itself out. What about understanding the unknown? You know, so there's a lot of genetic variants that are thought to be mostly deleterious or, you know, a quote unquote, um, uh, not beneficial, but upon deeper inspection, perhaps there's an advantage and in, in a scenario we don't quite understand. Right. And so, uh, I've, and I've heard, I've, I've read some, some articles, uh, you kind of talked a little bit about this, not necessarily in the regard of, um, you know, germline editing or anything, but, uh, with respect to the importance of neurodivergence, uh, you know, and how you have narcolepsy and uh, how you've basically, I, I think you've, you've talked about, you know, many creative ideas coming from potentially having, having that, uh, uh, quote unquote disorder. Uh, uh. So uh, I'm kind of just uh, curious on your thoughts about how to foresee or like what, you know, like that, that, that sort of territory, uh, understanding the unknown. You know? Right. So it's, it's very similar to other technologies. You know, it was, it was unknown um, what the cell phones were going to fry our brains. It was unknown, uh, you know, for MRIs, uh, which have, you know, very big magnets, uh, um, you know, locomotives crashed, uh, they collided head to head, uh, because of poor scheduling. Uh, so when we, uh, think, so there will be negative consequences. Some of them are caught in the phase one, two, and three clinical trials that FDA requires. Some of them are caught later sometimes semi-humorously referred to as phase four clinical trials, but meaning it's out in the population and catch them later, like hormone replacement therapy and Vioxx are two examples, recent examples. Um, thalidomide is a slightly older example. That, so I think the point is not to have zero risk. There is no way to have zero risk. Doing nothing is very risky. Um, Status quo is very risky relative to the future. Um, so what we need to do is just be very cautious, start with small um, animal studies or human organoids, start with small human clinical trials, and then slowly grow um, as we gain confidence that it is safe and effective. Um, in the specific examples uh, of where there's a trade-off, I mean, I think it's very interesting to talk about trade-offs. S sometimes people will say, what about the perfect human? I said, is there a perfect human? I mean, what does that even mean? Uh, is there a perfect means of transportation is, is a comeback? You know, it's like, is a bicycle perfect or is it the uh, super tanker? You know, bicycle is not so good at carrying, you know, tons of, of, of goods. Um, and a super tanker does not get you to school in a few minutes. Uh, so there's no perfect, there's just, there's all these trade-offs that, that depend on the environment. So, um, uh, people will say, well, CCR5 is not a good idea for germline. And maybe it's not even a good idea for somatic because it could make you sensitive to West Nile or to certain influenza. But Another way of thinking about it, well, you don't have to knock out CCR5 just because there are people walking around with CCR5 nulls. You could be a no more nuanced where you take out the parts so that you engineer the protein, as we were talking about earlier with the machine learning. You would knock out the parts of the protein that bind to the virus, but not the parts of the protein that do their immunological function. So you could end up with something that's HIV resistant and West Nile resistant um, rather than or. Um, uh, and, and, uh, you know, I think narcolepsy and dyslexia that I've uh, had, um, and ADD, OCD, high functioning, uh, autistic, bipolar, these do have potential advantages to society, 
we, we don't have to eliminate them, but we should maybe give the affected people a choice if we can. It's, it's not always possible. Some of the damage is done during embryogenesis, but that some of that might be fixable as an adult. Or we might be able to give them a knob that they can twist. They could say, okay, I want to be autistic for the next three days so I can get, you know, finish my thesis. You know, and I can just focus and, and just don't think about human relations. And then I can dial it back um, because I have to meet with the president of the university, you know, and I have to be charming uh, and not uh, it, by his definition, his neuro, neurotypical uh, view of the world. And so you're accommodating. Or, you know, you name it. That a lot of the reason that neuroatypicals are beneficial is not because a particular, it's not because that particular disease is not a disease or that particular disease that benefits. It's just because we're off of center in any direction. Um, maybe even obesity or religious choice. Anything that takes us far away from the center of the bell curve makes us feel alienated, which, which gives us maybe more time to pursue intellectual activities rather than social media, uh, or, it, or it makes us um, focus on like proving that, that we're just as good as the, the, uh, the uh, handsome, uh, you know, well-articulated, um, uh, you know, model in the middle of the bell curve. So anyway, whatever it is, it isn't necessarily a particular thing that we need to preserve in the population, although we should think creatively about, um, about that. So maybe one last uh, topic before we, before we uh, end, and uh, another area of, of research that you've been involved in is the gene drive. Yeah. Um, you know, and maybe some people listening or, you know, watching know what that is, but uh, using it to eradicate insect carrying human disease like malaria, um, Lyme the technology, yeah. yeah, Lyme disease. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so I'm just sort of, of curious about, um, you know, your, your work on that and, and, and your work on also trying to uh, make sure you address concerns like yeah. unintentionally leading to extinction of a species or something. Right. So I, I think um, um, one approach to, so, so the extinction of species is one part of it. So you can do gene drives whose intention is to make a species resistant to uh, something that's bad for a third species. So for example, you could make um, mosquitoes are resistant to malaria. They don't carry it on to humans. So there's a three species problem. And you're not really making anything extinct necessarily, although since malaria is a human specific disease, you might make malaria extinct. Um, but you could inadvertently, I think the scenario you're painting here, inadvertently make that mosquito extinct as well. Now, there's a limited number of mosquitoes that carry um, malaria, maybe half dozen major ones out of 3,500 species of mosquito. One could argue that um, there are very few known species that are dependent upon mosquitoes. Uh, the males are pollinators. Uh, females um, are the bloodsuckers in this case. Um, but uh, even mosquito fish do not depend on uh, mosquitoes. But anyway, we, we, we should do more study of the ecosystem uh, interactions. Uh, we should test them extensively uh, to see that they don't cause extinction. In, um, they have these um, large enclosed uh, ecosystems you know, so that include small villages and farms and so forth. Um, e uh, extinction tends to occur more easily in... Um, small populations, as long as the environment is still complex. Um, so, so, so we could do tests like that. Um, but it also helps if the species that we're putting at risk uh, is okay to go extinct. I mean, there are a lot of species going extinct, and I'm probably you know, getting rid of half a dozen mosquito species that have, where we're pretty confident that they don't impact other species might be acceptable. But 
first priority is to try to do it without that. And the way that it's going to make it uh, into, again, into public positive consciousness is, uh, um, you know, my former postdoc and, and colleague at MIT, Kevin Esfeld, has gone to Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard and, uh, and asked whether they would be favor having a gene drive wipe out Lyme disease. I, they hate Lyme disease, but having gene drive wipe out Lyme disease do nothing or to have a, a non-gene drive um, shock and awe of a whole new engineered rodent population that is resistant to Lyme disease, but not via a gene drive. And of those three scenarios, I think they like the third one the best. They don't want to do nothing. They don't want a gene drive just yet. Let's try a genetically engineered uh, rodent population. It's a little more expensive, a little, you know, probably less sure, um, but but that's that's the kind of communication, the dialogue between um, all of almost all of the people on the islands or their representatives in the town councils. Um, they were surprisingly uh, interested in the science and how it could affect their Lyme disease is a horrible disease. Um, um, it'd be hard to do the same thing in malaria, and that's why Lyme might be a better choice for these two different. GMO strategies, um, but I think that's that's the pathway by which it might uh, get better. There, are, there also, you know, there is a pretty good Lyme vaccine that was blocked for no particularly great reason. It was, uh, it happened to bad timing that happened around the same time as the fake data on uh, uh, vaccines causing uh, autism. Uh, Wakefield, I think, was this scientist's name who, who faked the data and later was, when that was revealed, but the damage was already done. People kept repeating it as if for a fact for many years after it was shown to be false. Um, and so they pulled uh, the um, Lyme disease vaccine off. Now, back then, Lyme disease was, was also a less serious disease. I think if that were put to a vote today, they would have uh, kept the vaccine. And then there are some new vaccines uh, that are slightly better aimed either at multiple um, tick-borne diseases, not just Lyme, multiple strains of Lyme. Um, so that hopefully those will, since, since now people do know the consequences of voting against the vaccine, hopefully they'll accept it this time. It's been in use in dogs ever, the whole time. It's, in the, it's one of these cases where dogs get better medical care than humans do because you know, we love our dogs and apparently we don't care about ourselves. Yeah, your your uh, experiments with the dogs and, and seeking FDA approval for that being a treatment uh, in animals is pretty exciting. Yeah, um, as, as is the Lyme disease vaccine for dogs. Yeah. Uh, okay, so I, I have a personal question for you. Yeah. Um, you know, we talked a little bit about the the, the narcolepsy and, and uh, I know I've, I've read that you've, attributed a lot of creative ideas to uh, perhaps being in a limbo between dreaming and awake awakeness. Uh, no. But I'm, I'm, I'm wondering like, you know, what your, your, your day is like, um, you know, and in, in, like, do you have like a routine uh, or you just, how do you, how do you get these, you know, creative ideas or, you know, uh, remember them or just kind of any insights on into that? Yeah, I mean, first of all, any any uh, personal stories that uh, the scientist says shouldn't be taken as like recommendations, but they're just anecdotes. Um, the recommendations come from clinical trials. It's a little hard to do with with things, you know, like um, narcolepsy, but it's possible. Anyway, my, in my case, uh, uh, you know, I found coping. First of all, I found that I had it. You know, it's, it's one of these diseases that you, that is, could be very impactful, but nevertheless, combination of, uh, uh, of ignorance and um, denial and so forth. I just didn't recognize it uh, until I was maybe late 30s. Um, probably it had a, a serious onset uh, when I was 13. Uh, looking back on it, I had a lot of headaches took a lot of medications for headaches. And then it just, the headaches disappeared, but 
sleepiness started kicking in much more. Um, um, the, um, so I, so, so after discovering it, I, I, one thing I do is I communicate it. I, I don't hide it. You know, the, sometimes the, your diseases that you don't tell people about can kill you more than people, the, the things that you communicate. Um, so, uh, you know, narcolepsy is potentially fatal in, uh, you know, traffic accidents. Um, I know some of my colleagues, um, um, hid their diabetes from everybody, but except, except me, uh, they, um, which can be fatal, almost was fatal in one case, um, just because the people around them didn't know what was happening when he went into shock. Um, so that's one thing is disclosure. Um, again, I'm not necessarily recommending that. I'm just saying what I do. A second thing is I don't eat, uh, during most of the day I eat right before I go to bed, which is not a good thing for most people. Uh, you want to eat well before you go to bed, but I basically, uh, the tendency to go to sleep after a meal, which is true for many people, is especially true for me. And so I, um, found that that was good. I, uh, if I'm not in a conversation like this, I tend not to fall asleep in conversations, but I will fall asleep in lectures. So I tend to try to stand or pace, um, um, or do some other activity that's not too, um, doesn't require too much brain power. Um, but it keeps me awake. I, I will, however, fall asleep standing up or walking or even riding my bicycle. So, um, and I don't drive. So that's, uh, um, it's another coping mechanism. Um, you know, I'm, there's a whole bunch of jobs that I couldn't get. Uh, I'm unemployable in many jobs. So, so I happened to pick one that, that, uh, fits, that fits okay. Um, so those are, those are some anecdotes. Oh yeah. And in terms of, I think you want like, uh, for inspiration, you know, the, I don't have a lot of control over it. I, t I, t I tend to fall asleep when I'm either super bored or super excited slash, uh, have a difficult problem. So if I have a difficult problem, very, very commonly I'll fall asleep. Uh, if my comp computer is having trouble or crashing, I'll fall asleep. Uh, and I'll often come up with an answer to the, either the abstract problem or the practical problem, um, within seconds of waking up, I wake up like, you know, it's, it's, some people are kind of groggy. I'm like already at a, at like high heightened state of awareness when I, when I wake up from a nap, the naps last from anywhere from a second to, um, an hour, um, usually in the multi-second range. Anyway, it's a very strange experience. Uh, I'm not sure I recommend it, but you, you get used to it after a while. And, the, and, and as you're going out, you, your, your decision-making is very poor. You're, you're like blurring reality with, with a dream world. So you, you're like, you're incorporating things that you're seeing because your eyes are still open. Typically my eyes are still open and, uh, and then I'll be completely asleep. Uh, when I didn't know that I had done, I had it, I would, I would, I did have a driver's license for a few years. Uh, I would pull up to a stop, to a, a stoplight and I'd put on the parking brake because I didn't, didn't know what I was going to go to sleep, but didn't want to go to sleep with the, without the parking brake. So, and then I, at that point I sort of realized I got a problem. I, I, and I went to sleep clinics to make sure that I had a problem and then I stopped and I stopped driving. I don't know how much of this is true. I, I, re I once read that uh, Salvador Dali used to put a spoon on his nose, um, and he'd sit up and uh, fall asleep with it. And the, he would, when he would wake, you know, when the spoon woke him or something, oh. when, when it was falling, that he had this inspiration and creative right. ideas for his paintings. Right. And I, yeah. I don't know if it's real, but uh, I, I think I think that's I think that is true. Uh, I, I think it's true for a lot of people. He just tried to capture it. Uh, he tried to you know, harness it. Uh, I, I, there's one set of theories that dreaming is where you're doing kind of trash collection and you're like cleaning up house and, or, or preparing yourself for unlikely scenarios. And you really shouldn't interrupt that. It's not good for you. But if your goal is to harness 
weird stuff, uh, then it's then it's a good thing. Uh, um, so yeah, his, his art is it really reflects the dream state. I think uh, better than most of the uh, Dadaist and surrealist artists uh, around that, that era. Um, so maybe he had something. You know, it's hard to say. Right. He, he was um, good at making up stories, though. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, well, Dr. Church, thank you again. Uh, such an honor to have you t- on the podcast and have a discussion with you, uh, be able to ask you, ask you some questions. I usually, at the end of the podcast, um, I direct people that want to kind of follow more of your your work. I know you're on Twitter. Your Twitter, Twitter handle is at geochurch, G-E-O-C-H-U-R-C-H. You also have a lab website. And uh, if you Google church lab website, yep. it's like the first hit. Yeah. Uh, but you also wrote a book yes. published was in 2014, Regenesis, How Synthetic Biology Will Reinvent Nature and Ourselves. And there was a very kind of interesting backstory to that. Well, there were a bunch of backstories to that one. Uh, let's see. Which one are you thinking about? Uh, I mean, I, I, you know, whichever, whichever is the most well, I'll, interesting. I'll, I'll, I'll tell two. Uh, what one, what, well, the short one is uh, Ed Regis was a co-author, uh, and my uh, agent and publisher wanted uh, me to have a, a, a ghostwriter, and I did not feel comfortable with having a true ghostwriter where you don't acknowledge them. So I, uh, Ed had just interviewed me for Discover Magazine, and he had written, I don't know, nine popular science books already. So I thought that was, that would be a good partnership. And I learned a ton about writing. I hope he, he enjoyed his lessons in synthetic biology. So that was, that was one part. The other thing that's probably slightly more interesting is the book was encoded into DNA. And I bet that's what you were thinking. It, uh, I, I, I got to the point where we've been working on reading and writing DNA for a few years. And I realized, Hey, we can read and write very easily. Why don't we write a book in DNA and then read it? Um, with the, the, the best technologies of the day. And, uh, and that was partly prompted by a, a review that I wrote of a scientific paper where the authors had uh, synthesized uh, a, a, geno- a very tiny genome and had put their names into the genome in, in a simple code. And, and I was asked to review that paper from that la- the, the, the Venter... Clyde Hutchinson, uh, Ham Smith, uh, were some of the uh, senior authors, and uh, and so I, re- I reviewed the article and I decided I would write it in a in DNA, uh, the whole the whole review uh, in DNA, uh, and 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 I sent it in uh, in a, in a in a different code than they had used a better I thought it was a better code, and uh, the editor normally would you would think would send it back to me and say look use English. <laughs> and, but instead the editor sent it on to them, you know, unchanged without, without any English at all. And, uh, fortunately one of the senior authors, I think it was Clyde Hutchison knew enough programming that he, that he broke the code and, 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 uh, did the, and wrote through and understood the review. So, uh, then having written that code to, to write the review, I said, well, I'll use that same code to do my book. Uh, cause it was, it was already available. And the and the and that and the code had the advantage. Theirs only dealt with uh, uppercase letters, while mine handled zeros and ones. And zeros and ones were a much more general uh, encoding method, and so I could not just encode the uppercase letters, but um, pictures. Pictures in JPEG form are zeros and ones. You know, in principle, l- later movies, audio, uh, all kinds of things have been encoded. Using using the zeros and ones strategy, um, so so I wrote, the, uh, did the book, made my 70, 70 billion copies, which is more than you know, like the top hundred books put together prior to that, and um, and it and it and it, to my surprise, it kind of launched an industry. There's now an international consortium for this kind of digital encoding. Uh, it's not displacing, uh, you know you know, this little disk drives, but it is, uh, um, it's moving in that direction. But another thing that that's happening is, uh, 
is we're incorporating it into recording into living organisms, which I kind of alluded to when we're getting to the million, you know, why would we do a million edits, is we can record physiological data. Uh, so for example, we recorded um, um, two terabytes of information in a mouse in one billionth the mass of the mouse. So it's the, one of the world's smallest recording devices, a billionth of a mouse can encode two terabytes. Um, and, and the next step will be to take it up to 20 petabytes um, using these, uh, these multiplex or uh, repetitive elements. So, uh, so those are two of the backstories. There's a few more, but I'll, some of them are documented in the book. I'll let the readers read the books. Uh, I think the book really has not aged much since 2014, even though the field is like exponentially improving and, and so forth. Uh, the, 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 the book, uh, I think, was futuristic enough that it, that it, uh, and it wasn't wrong yet <laughs> anyway. Well, I look forward to reading it. I, uh, I've learned a tremendous amount just from doing some background research. I, I had no idea synthetic biology. I mean, I just I knew so little about it. And, uh, you know, I, I came into this podcast, I, I focused a lot on aging and I'm very, what humans not interested in aging, what human adult is not interested in aging, right? Uh, but but after preparing and, and, and doing this background research and reading, this field of synthetic biology and, and just everything that you're doing is just so exciting. I mean, oh, just understatement, you. just so exciting. So thank you so much for all your research and, and what you, you know, what you're going to continue to do. I, I, I mean, the world, you know, you're, you're, you're going to be history books and all, all that stuff. So uh, again, a huge honor, uh, Dr. Church. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. You, you, you're, you've, you're, You've created one of the best uh, set of questions I've ever seen. Uh, you took you took us from where most people stop to to uh, a whole nother level. Uh, and I hope the next interview <laughs> starts where you left off, if possible. But anyway, <laughs> terrific job, uh, and I greatly enjoyed it. Um, hard to believe you didn't know much synthetic biology before this. So. <laughs> <Zero>. <laughs> But but uh, I'm, I'm reading your book and um, uh, yeah. I, I'm I, I just I'm so excited I can't wait to continue I, I, to follow. I'm writing it. another one now. It's it's been eight years. Um, I have a lot of day jobs, so I don't have that much time. But it won't be exactly a sequel. But it will it'll be wildly different. And but I I learned a lot from writing that one. This one I'll probably write solo, or I have been writing solo so far. So anyway. Well, I hope to have another conversation with you again. Uh, okay. Thank you. Sounds, sounds good. Take care. You too. Thanks.